One thing the Lord is teaching me is that concern doesn't equal anxiety. Concern in and of itself is not a bad thing, um, but unaddressed concern that can slowly grow into fear and worry does become bad, and it does turn into anxiety that rules our heart and our mind. And God doesn't want the concerns of our life to, to govern our minds, um, to rule our thought processes, and to dictate our decisions. Um, God wants us to be free, not from the concern itself, but from being um, driven by those concerns. And so I just want to make this very clear up front. Um, you can be concerned about something and have a good godly concern, um, it, whether it's the needs in your life or the kingdom of God or people's salvation um, or your future. You can have a concern for things without being anxious and worried. In Matthew chapter 6, 24, I'm going to break this down as best as I can, and then I'm going to kind of shoot from the hip. Matthew 6, 24, Jesus ends um, a little section of the Sermon on the Mount. He's bringing that little section to a close by saying, no one can serve two masters. So this is the overall idea, that your heart, your mind, your decision-making process, your life cannot be ruled and governed by two separate masters. You can't have loyalty to two individual masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or either you will prefer the one uh, and hate the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. So to be loyal to one, and you go, what are the two masters in this situation, in this illustration? The two masters Jesus is going to use as reference points are going to be God and money. So you have master number one, God. You have master number two, money. And what Jesus is saying as he jumps into anxiety, as he jumps into addressing needs and concerns, he's going to let us know that he's leading from this topic of not being concerned with financial issues, financial provision, financial needs. Otherwise, you begin to look to money as your God and you become loyal to where the money is and you let money drive your life. And, and suddenly, one of the metrics in your decision-making process is, is how much money will I make from this? How much money will this produce? How much money will I amass? And so what Jesus is saying is you can't be fully loyal and devoted to God and his kingdom and the work he has for you while having loyalty to money as your master. Because whoever your master is, uh, Romans will tell us, um, that's the one who will dictate how you live. So we live in the direction of our ultimate affection, right? Where my greatest desire lies, where my greatest treasure is, um, that's where I can tell the trajectory of my life and where it's heading. Verse 25, as he's leading in from this, you can't have two masters, he says, therefore. So usually when the word therefore is in scripture, uh, what he's about to say, what the author is about to say, or the speaker is about to say, is connected to what he just said. In light of what I just said, because of that, I tell you, don't be anxious about your life. Do not be anxious about your life. Apparently, it is our choice to be anxious about the things revolving around our life. The, the, the temporary, material, physical nature of this visible world and our temporary life, there are many needs um, that have the potential to drive you to anxiety. And what Jesus is saying is, because you can't be loyal to two different masters, because you, your loyalty should lie with God alone, and it, it, that's, that's really the only option is to have one master, you should not be anxious. And you and I go, well, easier said than done, Jesus, God in the flesh, no real concern, just tiptoeing on water, shutting down storms, calling the dead, you know, back to life. It's easy for you to say. And Jesus would say, well, I took on real legitimate humanity, 100% God in 100% flesh. So the human nature and the human condition and the human existence and that reality uh, is something that Jesus has fully experienced apart from sin. He's gone through death. He knows hunger. He knows thirst. He knows exhaustion. He knows being burdened. He knows being overwhelmed uh, and bringing that to the Father and letting peace invade his life. He, he knows what it is to be distraught and to be driven to a sense of even despair um, and distress. He knows what it is to um, have concern for others and, and to, to have a deficiency in some area and have the Father, you know, fill that up. He knows the human condition. So yes... He knows what it is to have the temptation to be anxious. So don't be anxious about your life. Most of 
the anxieties that plague our mind, especially as we're falling asleep at night and trying to calm down the mind, the anxieties and concerns that we most often experience are relating to this temporary world in our life. When you, when you really like put these things into perspective, uh, when you really see these things against the backdrop of God, His kingdom, eternity, His glory, and heaven, you realize that, wow, all the things I'm worried about um, are not as big of a deal as God's kingdom and His glory and eternity. In other words, when I stand before God, I will not be looking back at the things that I'm currently stressed about. So the things regarding our life, Jesus will break that down. What you will eat, number one. What you will drink, right? So the physical needs of your body. Nor about your body itself, what you will put on, right? So the clothing, the covering, the physical needs of your body, which are legitimate, and we're not going to overlook that. Isn't life more than food? Isn't, isn't the body more than clothing? In other words, what Jesus is saying is, The substance of your life, the purpose and meaning of your existence should not and cannot be reduced down to the physical needs you experience. Clothing is a legitimate need. Food, you can't just walk around naked. Food is a legitimate need. You can't just run off nothing. Your body needs energy and food to survive. You need water. You need hydration. These are real legitimate things that we should be concerned with but not anxious about. And some of us are tiptoeing the line. We're going, I'm just, I, I'm just living with a healthy concern. I want to be faithful and responsible. You're actually falling into anxiety while masquerading it, letting it masquerade in your life as a, a godly concern. I'm trying to be faithful. And so what Jesus is about to say is look at the birds. So your life should not be reduced down to just the physical needs of your life. If, if you're life vision, if your goals, if your ambition, if your dreams, if if your life purpose can be summed up with just the physical needs of your life. I'm just living towards wherever my needs are. They drive my life. My decision-making processes are governed by where my needs are. Then you're not living the fullest life that Jesus has brought um, or come to bring you. So while you have legitimate needs, Paul will say in Philippians chapter 4, that though he had need, he wasn't in need, right? So this is another conversation on need. So I'm just going to keep sitting here until the Lord frees me from this because I know there are people in the chat who you are anxious. And it's because you have believed the lie um, that your life purpose is just to fill and meet each need that comes along throughout your life. My The summation of my life and existence and purpose for living is just to address and fill all the needs that come around. Um, And what Jesus is going to say is, no, life is more than that. Your body is more than that. You're made for more than that. Um, Those are just things along the way that will play into God's purpose for your life, but that you should not reduce your life down to that. Look at the birds of the air, right? So he's about to make the case even stronger by not just saying, don't just take my word for it, though you should. Let's look at nature, okay? Look at the birds of the air, What about the birds should I recognize? Well, they neither sow nor reap. They don't gather into barns. And I've heard people say, well, birds still uh, go out and hunt. Birds still go out and plan. Well, however much we can say they're planning. Birds still go out and, um, you know, bring food into their nest for their babies. They're out doing stuff. Yeah, but they're not necessarily storing up, sowing and reaping and planting and harvesting Uh, the way that we as humanity do, and often that's where our concern lies, is what will my works produce? I'm not, and and that, that, I think that's the admission within our anxiety. I think that is the uh, the, the healthy uh, uh, admission we need to make is that I don't control the uh, production of my labor. I am not in control of what my Uh, work produces and what results from my faithfulness. I might throw the seeds in the ground, but I don't control how much of a harvest I get to take in. I don't control when it grows. I don't control how it grows. I don't control what's happening underneath the surface in the dirt. Though you can cultivate such an environment where seed is more likely to thrive, we are not in control of the results of our labor and the fruit of our faithfulness. And I think when you admit that, it does either eliminate the anxiety or it puts the pressure on you to work harder. 
and to have exercise more control over the things that you assume control over. So you go, well, I don't have control over what my efforts produce, but I can work harder and I can stress myself into rest. And you know what I mean? Where I just, I burden myself with more work than God has told me to do because I don't have control over this area. So I'm going to overcompensate with the things I do have control over as my kids are absolutely nuts in the background. So birds, they're not sowing and reaping. You don't see birds going out to their field and going, hey, Bill. Did you, did you put some seed down in this area of the field? I didn't, Joe. Dang it, Bill. This is why our kids don't have food. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, we're going to have to wait till, uh, you know, the next season. Birds aren't strategizing and planning out uh, their harvest in that way and, and systematically planning out here are the steps we need to take. They go out, find food. There's wisdom, I think. There's a sense of, you know, a innate direction within their Um, their instincts, they know what they're doing, but Jesus does say the birds absolutely uh, aren't out there doing all the strategizing and planning and background research that we do before we take a leap and do something. Uh, we, we, We plan a lot. Planning is not bad. I don't want you to get the the wrong idea from what I'm saying. Planning good, uh, but planning out of anxiety and planning out of this illusion of control um, and fear that God won't provide, that's where I think we get into trouble. And so what you're going to see is that the birds of the air flying around just getting food each day, like in Matthew 6, Jesus does, tell the disciples, pray like this, Father, give us what we need today, our daily bread. Um, And so they're not gathering into barns, storing up. They're not out there building the barns, making sure they're big enough to handle the harvest that's coming in. Birds just go out each day and go, food, bring it home to the nest. And yet, and I love this word, yet, your heavenly Father feeds them. This is the reason Jesus uses birds as an illustration. Think about all the animals he could have pointed out. Of course, during the sermon, maybe, you know what, birds. That's a fantastic illustration. But of all the animals, of all the different things across nature, he chose birds. These, these animals that can soar and fly and they're high above it all. And yet at the same time, on a very practical level, they still rely on the basic uh, fundamental needs that, that, that we do. Food, water, oxygen, um, even housing and protection from the elements. So even though they don't sow, reap, or gather, your heavenly Father feeds them. In other words, this is not a conversation on God is taking care of the animals because of what they do. It's God is feeding the animals despite what they cannot do. So the emphasis is not on what the birds do. The emphasis on what is, is on what the birds do not and cannot do, right? So it's in the midst of their lack and deficiency and inability to sow, reap, and gather into barns right? Because you don't just see birds doing that when you look out in your backyard and go, there's another bird building a barn. We don't see that, which tells us that's not essential to their uh, life and existence, and yet God feeds them. So in other words, what Jesus is about to say is life is more than just your needs. Life is more than just the things that plague your mind and cause you to be anxious. Your heavenly father, despite what birds can't do, still feeds them. In other words, We are cared for, not because of our efforts in labor, right? But despite what we can't do. I'm going to say that again. God cares for us. We often, what we do is we restrict the provision of God to our own human labor and efforts and strength and ability and gifting and connections, right? And and background and experience. And all those things become the reason in our minds why we have what we have. And God would go, no, actually, I might use your efforts. I might involve you. You might have a responsibility. But the provision God brings and the fruit of our life and the result of our efforts, none of those are limited to uh, what we bring to the table. Otherwise, there'd be a cap on what we can have in experience. But Ephesians tells us, 
that God can actually do abundantly above and beyond what you even have the imaginative capacity to comprehend. So yet your father feeds them. He doesn't say, look at the birds. They're out there hunting. Get to work, boys and girls. God ain't just going to bring food from heaven. And they're like, actually, he did. Jesus goes, look at the birds and what they don't do. And yet God feeds them. It's despite what they cannot do, not because of what they can. That's a very big mental shift as I don't sip my, <laughs> my tea. That is a very big mental shift for some of you. To go from, I often thought that what God provides and how he provides is solely dependent on my efforts and ability and connection and knowledge and background and education. And I'm saying, no, it's not. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to share your thoughts and your insights in the comments. If you want to share your thoughts and questions about these studies, join us every Thursday evening at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for a live discussion together. And thank you for supporting this ministry. Your support helps us accomplish our mission, which is to teach people how to read the Bible so they can live and teach it for themselves. We're only able to make all of these free resources because of generous supporters like you. So thank you very much for all of your support. Make sure to visit AboveReproachMinistry.com to check out all of our free resources. And as always, keep moving towards Jesus.